2022. So we will look at the evidence from this and other work and take a judgment over what's appropriate for the rest of the country. Thank you. That ends topical question time. The next item of business is a statement by John Swinney on the Smith Commission. The Deputy First Minister will take questions at the end of his statement and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. Deputy First Minister, around 10 minutes. Presiding officer, I am grateful for the opportunity to set out for the Chamber today the Scottish Government's response to the proposals published by the UK Government on the Smith Commission last Thursday. The Government welcomes the publication of the UK Government command paper and the draft bill. While it is no secret that we do not believe that the Smith proposals go nearly far enough, the publication of these clauses is another important step in providing this Parliament with further levers to improve the lives of the people of Scotland. The objective of the Scottish Government now is to develop a bill that commands broad support ready for introduction as soon as possible after the United Kingdom general election in May. That is in line with the clear position of the Scottish Government that decisions affecting the lives of people in Scotland should be taken here in Scotland to reflect the priorities and views of those who choose to live and to work in this country. I also welcome the progress that the Scottish and UK governments have made in agreeing an order to transfer powers to give 16 and 17 year olds the vote in Scottish Parliament and local authority elections. That order was laid in both parliaments last week. Through joint working and effective coordination, we, could, we, should see, we should reach a similarly agreed position on the new Scotland Bill. Encouragingly, there are areas in the draft clauses where the initial drafting is already close to what should be in the final bill. Examples include the provisions on air passenger duty and on aggregates levy. Our initial assessment of the income tax provisions also suggests they are close to delivering what the Smith Commission recommended. There are, however, a number of areas that the Scottish Government wishes to see improved. First, I would highlight those provisions where Scottish ministers are required to consult UK ministers and those where they must obtain consent. No one in this chamber would want decisions of this parliament in areas such as the bedroom tax, frustrated by the need for consent from the UK government. Even the Secretary of State for Scotland agreed over the weekend that there should be no right of veto. So it is important that the UK government revisits those clauses that require consent. Second, devolution of employability programmes appears to be limited to those dealing with people at risk of long-term unemployment and to programmes over 12 months. Neither of these restrictions featured in the Smith Commission. I look to support from all other parties for the fullest possible implementation of these important powers. And third, we, and I think a wide range of stakeholders, we're concerned to see that Lord Smith's recommendation for a power to create new benefits in devolved areas simply does not appear in the command paper and the bill. The clauses only allow this Parliament to create new benefits in the much narrower areas of welfare to, to be devolved under the bill. Similarly, the ability to top up reserve benefits has been watered down to cases of hardship. That is not a credible interpretation of paragraph 54 of Smith, which said, and I quote, the Scottish Parliament will have new powers to create new benefits in areas of devolved responsibility. The Scottish Parliament will also have new powers to make discretionary payments in any, any area of welfare without the need to obtain prior permission from the Department of Work and Pensions. Nor is it credible to argue that this Parliament already has the competence to create benefits in devolved areas when social security re re schemes are specifically reserved under the Scotland Act. Many in this chamber will recall the difficulties this Parliament has faced in areas such as carers' benefits and council tax reductions due to this reservation, and it is therefore vital that the new power to create new benefits in devolved areas is put beyond any reasonable doubt. These, were rightly, these were rightly have been hailed as some of the most important of the Smith proposals, and this is perhaps the most serious omission in the Bill as it was published this week. More widely, there is detailed work to be done across a whole range of provisions to improve and to refine the draft clauses. There is already debate in academic circles about whether the provisions that guarantee the permanence of this Parliament and put the Sewell Commission on a statutory basis are as strong as they could be within legislation. The provision on the Crown Estate is complex and the nature of the scheme to transfer assets to the Scottish Government will need to be explored with the United Kingdom Government. We also need to be sure that this Parliament has legislative competence out to 200 miles under this draft provision. We will want to consider carefully the equalities provision to ensure it meets the Smith recommendation that the powers of the Scottish Parliament will include, but not be limited to, the introduction of gender quotas in respect of public bodies in Scotland. 
Amongst the other provisions that we will want to consider carefully are those on tribunals, consumer protection and advocacy and fixed odds betting terminals where stakeholders have already started to express doubts about the effectiveness of the draft clauses. I also want to stress the importance of non-legislative provisions of the proposals, most notably the fiscal framework to support the operation of the tax and spending powers. The negotiation around the fiscal framework will be more complex than negotiations on block grant adjustment for the Scotland Act 2012, although that experience is one that we can build on, but hopefully we can do it in slightly less time than it's taken on the block grant adjustment to date. There are new factors, such as the no detriment policy, which will seek to identify the relative costs and benefits of different policy decisions and the block grant adjustment for the assignment of VAT revenues. I welcome the United Kingdom Government's acknowledgement that we must move forward by negotiation and agreement in the many important issues that the fiscal framework will cover. There is clearly much to do to construct an agreed new fiscal framework that serves the needs of the people of Scotland. I will be looking for an early meeting with Treasury Ministers to progress this work. I would now like to turn, Presiding Officer, to the next steps in taking forward these issues. The Scottish Government's aim now is to work with the United Kingdom Government and others to develop the draft clauses into a bill with widespread support that is ready to be introduced to Westminster shortly after this year's general election. The UK Government's command paper envisages a similar process. I want to state clearly today the Scottish Government's commitment to working constructively with the UK Government to refine and to improve the draft clauses. In doing so, I hope we will see early consultation and a willingness to address areas of concern, as well as the support of other parties in the Chamber for issues that we advance. Of course, the next steps in this process are not for governments alone. The Scottish Government will be discussing uh, our plans for stakeholder engagement with the United Kingdom Government, and we will also be considering what other support we can offer stakeholders and the public to engage with the Bill. This Parliament will also play a key role in the next stages of consideration of these issues. Already the Devolution of Further Powers Committee, chaired by Mr Crawford, has issued a call for evidence on the command paper and the draft clauses. I expect the Committee to carry out detailed pre-legislative scrutiny of the Bill and also to give evidence in due course to the, bill, uh, to the, to the Committee. I know that the Committee has also planned a series of public engagements to allow the people of Scotland to have their say directly to Parliament on the relevant provisions. The first of these events is in Hamilton on the 2nd of February, with the following one in Aberdeen after the February recess. This is an important initiative by the Committee, and I take this opportunity to wish them every success in taking it forward. Publication of the UK Government's command paper and draft bill last week marks the start of a new phase of work on the Smith Commission's proposals, one that has opportunities for the Scottish Parliament and the people of Scotland to take the bill and to shape it to deliver what they want from the Smith Commission's work. The most immediate priority is ensuring that the bill introduced later this year delivers the spirit and intent of the Smith Commission in a coherent and practicable way. But beyond that, we have already begun to consider how these powers should be used to improve the lives of the people of Scotland. As many people have commented, that is the underlying purpose of this exercise. The Scottish Government has already set out how it plans to use some of the powers that will come to the Scottish Parliament to create jobs, to boost the economy and to tackle inequality. We have made clear proposals to cut air passenger duty, to replace the work programme and to make sure local communities benefit from the devolution of the Crown Estate. This Parliament will need to agree to the bill introduced in Westminster later this year. The Scottish Government will support that process to achieve transfer of competence as swiftly and as effectively as possible. At the same time, the Government will be consulting with the public and interested groups about how these powers should be used and how we share powers with local authorities and local communities across Scotland. President Officer, let me conclude by saying to the Chamber that there should be a common objective of ensuring the Smith Commission Agreement is implemented as swiftly and as effectively as possible. That means all of us recognising those parts of the proposals that represent good progress and working with the Scottish Government to argue for improvements in key relevant areas. We in the Scottish Government are determined to argue for what is in the best interests of the people of Scotland, but in the end, it will be for the people of Scotland to judge at the ballot box whether these proposals meet their ambitions and whether they have in fact been delivered.
Thank you, Deputy First Minister. We will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around about 20 minutes for that, after which we move on to the next item of business. Members who wish to ask a question of the Deputy First Minister should press the request speak button now. And I call Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Deputy First Minister for an advance copy of his statement and welcome the publication of the command paper, which heralds the biggest ever transfer of powers to this Parliament since devolution. Labour has said that we will deliver the Home Rule Scotland Bill in the first 100 days of a Labour government with extensive new powers over tax, jobs and welfare uh, that will form the basis of a modern Home Rule for Scotland. At the same time, as protecting the bonus that we receive from the Barnet formula. I note the Scottish Government's response to consultation with the UK Government about changes to universal credit. I genuinely don't believe that this amounts to a right of veto. It is about practical issues like timing, and I'm sure we all agree that the sensible thing to do in the interest of ensuring smooth transition is to do exactly that, is for both governments to talk to each other. It was wrong, I think, to suggest that there is any other intent other than that behind that. Mr Swinney's comments about an employment programme, as I understand it, don't reflect the discussions in the Smith Commission. Clause 22 gives the Scottish Parliament full powers over this area, and it means that all of the work programme will be devolved in addition to other smaller employability programmes. And we agree that job creating powers are important. The work programme is important in that regard. It's not worked very effectively, so I welcome the opportunity to reform it. But Labour want that devolved now. Labour would equally reform the work programme, but we would devolve this to local authorities who we think are best placed to tackle mm -hmm. the challenge of jobs. So will the Cabinet Secretary join with Labour in calling for the urgent devolution of the work programme and in turn commit to devolving this to local authorities? And finally, Presiding Officer, could I ask the Deputy First Minister whether he could provide us with a timetable for getting the fiscal framework that he spoke about in place? Deputy First Minister. Uh, first of all, I think... Uh, yeah, Jackie Bailey, um, in her first remark about universal credit, I think misses the point of what we have been presented with, not in the, the words of the command paper, but in the words of the clauses. Jackie Bailey is an experienced parliamentarian. She knows the significance of um, every single word in a legislative provision. And um, the reading of, uh, sec of uh, section 24 of the draft clauses from the United Kingdom government as they affect universal credit, um, I think raised the significant doubts that the Scottish Government has raised about the fact that UK ministers would be able to stop a Scottish Government being able to take forward reforms in this area if they chose to do so. They would have a basis of saying so, either in relation to practicability or in relation to timing. And um, Jackie Bailey will understand the view that the Scottish Government takes, which I think is consistent, utterly consistent with the Smith Commission, that believed that these powers should be devolved to the Scottish Parliament for them to be exercised by the Scottish Parliament. They were not to be exercised with caveats applied to them, which is the problem which is in section 24. So I, I, I think because of the fact that we are dealing with clauses of a draft bill, we have to get precision into those provisions. And I think as I look at the way in which the UK, the UK, UK ministers, to be fair to them, have said since Thursday morning, there is absolutely no caveats, no problems, no obstacles. I simply say, well, in the spirit of dialogue, let's change that clause and remove any possible caveats there could be to the exercising of those responsibilities here in the Scottish Parliament. On the question of employment programmes, um, the Scottish Government it wants to see the devolution of employment programmes to the Scottish Parliament. We have made no secret of the fact that we think the work programme has been a poor performing programme. We think it would be better performing if it was integrated in the wider employability provisions that are put in place, some of which are taken forward by our local authority partners, some of which are taken forward by third sector organisations, both of them in a more successful fashion than the work programme has been able to take these issues forward. The problem that we face is that the work programme contracts have been extended beyond 
the period that we all reasonably thought they would be in existence for um, and extended while the Smith Commission was actually deliberating on this very question. So I, I, we certainly may, have made the point to the UK Government and will continue to make the point to the UK Government that uh, we, um, we need to ensure that um, these, the, the wide range of employment programmes are available to us and we will of course uh, be happy to take forward the delivery and, uh, of these programmes in partnership with our local authority colleagues. And the final point Jackie Bailey raised with me was about the timescale for the fiscal framework. I, as I've indicated in my statement, uh, wish to embark on early discussions with UK ministers on the fiscal framework. It is very important, not just for me, but for all of us, because the fiscal framework that, takes, that emerges out of these pr provisions will affect every single member of the Scottish Parliament and will affect the, um, the, the judgments we are able to make and the issues with which we have to wrestle. So it is a process that Parliament needs to consider carefully um, and the Government certainly will advance those discussions at an early stage and inform Parliament of their, of their course. Presenting officer, can I too thank the Cabinet Secretary for a prior sight of his statement and thank him too for something of a welcome surprise. I like the character of the statement. It was unexpectedly conciliatory and that is in striking contrast to some of the language we've had from the Scottish Government post the Smith report. I even see in here presiding officers from welcomes and the word encouragingly. So I feel we're making progress and things are indeed looking up and constructive um, partnership between the Scottish Government and the Westminster Government, I think, is, is uh, something we can very much hope for with a degree of confidence. Presiding officer, the Smith Commission was very clear that this was not just about the transfer of powers from Westminster to this Parliament. It, it was also about how we actually deal with devolving some power to local authorities and local communities. And I'm pleased to say that the... Um, the Cabinet Secretary includes this in the final uh, part of his statement where he specifically uh, refers to consultation with the public and industry groups about how these new powers should be used and how we share these powers with indeed local authorities and local communities. But can I ask him to confirm that consideration should also be given to how we share the existing powers of this Parliament? Because I don't think we should just look at the new powers in a vacuum in isolation. And I hope he will agree that there's a broader, a broader remit there that could usefully be explored. Can I also ask him, has he got a time frame in mind for this whole process? And if so, what is that? Deputy First Minister. Uh, Presiding Officer, um, the last time... Um, Ms Goldie and I exchanged words on the Smith Commission. Uh, she somewhat unjustly accused me of being curmudgeonly. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it, was, it was of the many things I've been accused of in this Parliament, I thought the most unwarranted, actually, <laughs> presiding officer. Um, uh, it, it forced me into some ungallant remarks back to uh, Ms Goldie, which I shall refrain from uh, in this spirit of cooperation today. Um, I agree with the, the, so a number of the points that Ms Goldie has made about uh, devolution of, of powers within Scotland. Uh, obviously, when this government came to power, we took a strategic decision about um, enabling local authorities to exercise much greater fiscal flexibility than they had had previously by removing the ring fencing arrangements that have been in place across many aspects of public expenditure to date. And that gave local authorities the freedom to make particular choices uh, according to the needs of their localities. Um, I do accept that there is an argument, I've made the argument in my statement, for the devolution of responsibilities to local authorities and also to local communities. And that mm -hmm. whole concept yep. is, is it's a debate which I, I'm sure Ms Goldie accepts, which is more than about devolution to another tier of government. It's to our communities and the, um, the community empowerment legislation which uh, Mr Biagi has taken through Parliament, um, which was introduced by Mr Mackay, is uh, designed to encourage that whole process of discussion and involvement at local communities and to ensure that our communities are able to achieve a great deal more as a consequence of the responsibilities they can exercise uh, on their own free will. Uh, finally, in relation to timescale, uh, obviously uh, I would like to make as much progress on uh, addressing some of the very specific issues we have about the clauses before the United Kingdom general election. That means that the swiftest start can be made to legislating by the UK Parliament immediately after the UK general election and of course the committee that Mr Crawford chairs uh, will be looking at these issues within Parliament and I'm sure will have a substantial contribution to make to the process as well. Linda Fabiani, followed by Willie Rennie. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I've noticed 
uh, again today that the Labour Party keep referring to the draft clauses and coming legislation as the Home Rule Scotland Bill, which appears to be the new mantra. May I ask the Deputy First Minister whether he considers that the draft clauses as presented can in any measure whatsoever be described as Home Rule? Deputy First Minister. It is not a description I would apply to, to these provisions. Uh, there are greater powers for the Parliament. I have made that quite clear to Parliament already. But there are some significant uh, areas of responsibility that remain reserved to the United Kingdom Government, which should be transferred to the Scottish Parliament to constitute the term Home Rule. Um, and I would also make the point that the exchange I had with Jackie Bailey about Section 24 is illustrative of some of the constraints that still percolate uh, their way into the draft clauses. And we have to use the opportunity of dialogue to remove those provisions to ensure that we have the ability to exercise powers uh, as we judge fit here in Scotland. Willie Rennie, followed by Duncan McNeill. I, th um, I thank the Deputy First Minister for an advanced copy of the statement. I think Annabel Goldie is right. He's made a remarkable transformation to bad cop to good cop uh, within the space of just one week. I hope that uh, continues because the response to the Smith Agreement and the subsequent publication of the clauses was deeply negative from the Scottish Government. This is the transfer of £20 billion worth of new taxes, a £3 billion new Scottish welfare system. That transfer will pose considerable challenges for this Parliament and this Government. And we've seen with Revenue Scotland the real difficulties that, pose, that were posed to this Government and to the Parliament with just the transfer of two small taxes. So to avoid the repeat of those mistakes, will he agree to the establishment of a cross-party advanced fiscal team to plan the effective and orderly implementation of these new substantial powers. Deputy First Minister. Um, well, I, I, can, I can go back to bad cop quite quickly <laughs> if Mr Rennie would like it. Uh, and I'm kind of tempted after the baloney we've just heard from Mr <laughs> Rennie. Um, first of all, just as a matter of fact, less than 30% of Scottish taxes will be set in Scotland after this uh, conclusion. Yeah. Less than 30%. 14% of welfare spend will be devolved to Scotland. If, if that's the summit of Mr... I, I'm quite sure there were, there were moments in the Smith Commission where Mr Rennie's uh, colleagues would have liked to have achieved more than what they actually achieved in relation to welfare devolution than was uh, secured at the end. So I don't think we should get a lecture from Mr Rennie about the extent of these provisions. Now, he mentioned Revenue Scotland and, you know, Revenue Scotland has to be ready for business on the 1st of April. That's when it's got to be ready for business. And I've said to Parliament consistently, I am very confident and have been very confident for some considerable time about the efforts that have been put in by uh, the team in Revenue Scotland to ensure that the, um, that the organisation is ready for its uh, its uh, operational activities on the 1st of April. I will be seeing the board on Thursday. I've been seeing regular updates. I am very pleased with the progress that's been made. And indeed, I do hope I'm able to make some further announcements about the progress that Revenue Scotland are making subject, uh, of course, to wider discussions with the United Kingdom government. On his point about um, the uh, fiscal framework, the Scottish government has... Um, has uh, a, a role to perform in negotiating with the United Kingdom Government about the details of the fiscal framework. I will, of course, advise Parliament about the course of those discussions. But in case Mr Rennie is worrying about having a, a restless night, worrying about this particular point, I intend to fight very hard for the interests of Scotland in the fiscal framework. Duncan McNeill, followed by Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. I thought we'd escaped the bad cop for this, this afternoon, but apparently not, because I was, I was about to welcome the Cabinet Secretary's statement and, and like Annabel Goldie, recognise the, 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 the progress it's, it's not, uh, which is acknowledged in that statement and indeed the optimism that pro, progress to come. 
And while recognising that we have uh, got a lot of work to do, be more debate, it, it is absolutely necessary that de debate that there should be the bad cop, but only when it's necessary. We shouldn't be making up fights like we have done in Clause 22 when the Scottish Government claim that uh, the, the, the devolution of employment support fell well short of its promise, when Mr Swinney knows that he agreed in the Smith Commission that, that, those, those, uh, the, 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 that, um, that those powers that would remain in the hands of the UK Government in Smith was agreed in the examples of reserve job centres and, and, and indeed um, job benefits were agreed. Why doesn't he acknowledge where there is agreement fully and get on with the hard debate about the issues that still, there's still work to be done rather than fabricating debates over issues where there is no substance? Deputy First Minister. If, if, if Mr McNeill wants to throw in the, the towel on important issues that affect Scotland. That's up to Mr McNeill, yeah. but I won't do that. Uh, on yeah. the, the issues that we're concerned about, for example, around about universal credit, I've rehearsed with Jackie Bailey the issue of substance, the issue of substance that is at stake in the wording of the clause as it stands. Now, if Mr McNeill wants to just turn a blind eye to that and say, no, no, we should just roll over and let it all happen and we shouldn't bother about it, we shouldn't agitate to protect about it, then I don't know what precisely he's complaining about today. So what I'd say to Mr McNeill is the Scottish Government will go about the proper duty that we should have of making sure the Smith Commission's proposals are turned into reality in the clauses and there are no attempts to in any way constrain the exercise of responsibilities that properly should be exercised by the Scottish Parliament. Kevin Stewart, followed by Ian Gray. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, in response to the UK Government's published draft clauses, Margaret Lynch, Chief Executive of Citizens Advice Scotland, said, and I quote, The Smith Commission led us to believe the Scottish Government could craft its own welfare system outside of universal credit, taking into account the needs of Scotland. It seems now that offer has been withdrawn. Does the Deputy First Minister share Ms Lynch's views and does he feel that the welfare needs of the people of Scotland have been ignored by the UK Government? Deputy First Minister. I, I, I said in my statement that the, 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 there was a, a, a substantive concern about the narrow definition of the ability to create new benefits and I think that to me does not translate paragraph 54 of the Smith Commission into what anybody could believe was legislative provision and it's one of the issues that as a priority I think we need to revisit. Ian Gray followed by Chick Brodie. Um, the Deputy First Minister made mention of the principle of no detriment and indeed the commentary has made much of how difficult a principle this is. Uh, but Mr Swinney called this a new principle, but it isn't uh, a new principle, is it? Mr Swinney has just successfully negotiated a no-detriment settlement with regard to already devolved taxes, and indeed it was a negotiation uh, in which uh, the Scottish bloc in the end benefited more than initially it was thought perhaps might be the case. So will he agree with me that this principle of no-detriment is both well-established, understood and indeed effective? Deputy First Minister. If, Mr Gray must have been taking the optimistic tablets this morning if he, just, if he thinks that my block grant adjustment about land and buildings transaction tax was a cheery, optimistic affair. <laughs> uh, certainly, I, I would use none of those words to describe the whole process. There is a, there is a, 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 a significant difference, and this is, what, uh, and this is why I, I disagree with Mr Gray about the fact that the, the no-detriment principle is not new. The no detriment principle, as it will have to be applied and as it's speculated about in the command paper, relates to how um, the, the, um, where there is a devolution of an income tax responsibility, there will then be changes to the way in which expenditure decisions are calculated within the United Kingdom's existing framework through the Barnett formula. That is new territory. And that is why, in my answer to Jackie Bailey, I made it clear that it was in the interest of everybody in this parliament, whatever their politics, because, you know, heaven forfend, at some stage in the future, very unlikely, somebody else might have to stand here and do the finance secretary's job. Who knows? But heaven forfend, Mr Yousaf, exactly, heaven forfend. But it's in the interest of every one of us to make sure that the interests of Scotland are well protected by the application of that no detriment principle. Chick Brodie, followed by Colin Keir. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Given the ambiguities around the application or disapplication of conditions, 
as enshrined in clauses of the draft bill. Can the Scottish Government indicate what discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding the fiscal policies and framework needed to support the promised early introduction of the bill, and whether it will be discussing the issue of capital borrowing with the UK Government and the suggestion that capital spending could be replaced by borrowing, as the UK Government indicated when these fiscal requirements will be ready. First Minister. Well, th there have been no substantive discussions with the UK Government since the publication of the command paper on Thursday. Um, we have signalled our willingness to undertake those substantive discussions and I can assure Mr Brodie that that is exactly what we will endeavour to do. Colin Keir, followed by Lewis MacDonald. Thank you. Uh, given that it should have been devolved already through Calman, does the Deputy First Minister agree that air passenger duty can and must be devolved to the Scottish Parliament at the earliest opportunity? And can the Deputy First Minister provide assurances that he will pursue this with the UK Government at the earliest opportunity? I, I think there's, in all of the rhetoric around the clauses, there has been a point made by the United Kingdom Government that we should make early and swift progress after the UK general election. And that is the timetable that we certainly want to work to, to ensure that uh, all reasonable steps are taken urgently to secure the devolution of all of the responsibilities. And of course, the point that Mr Kerr makes, which I think is a, a very fair point, is that air passenger duty, he correctly highlights, was one of the issues in the Calman Commission, which was not translated into the Scotland Act 2012. We have to make sure that all of these provisions are translated into the uh, contents of the Scotland Bill that emerges as a consequence of this process. Lewis MacDonald, followed by Roderick Campbell. The Deputy First Minister will be aware of the increasing surcharges on packages and parcels delivered by a number of private companies, specifically in the north of Scotland, not only in the Highlands and Islands, but also in the rural North East. Does he agree that the UK command paper now gives Scottish ministers the powers they need to require a full investigation of competition issues specific to Scotland on the same basis as a UK Minister of the Crown? And does he agree that those new powers should be used to tackle discriminatory surcharging at the earliest opportunity? Um, where, uh, where we, where we uh, uh, attract and exercise powers of that nature, then uh, I do agree they should be um, utilised in that fashion. Uh, what we have to make sure is that we have the ability to exercise fully and comprehensively without reference to the United Kingdom Government, some of those powers and responsibilities. And um, the, uh, we have to ensure that where, for example, the involvement of the Scottish Government has been set out in a consultative fashion, that we are able to secure um, influence uh, uh, greater than that and to be able to exercise responsibilities that will, that will enable us uh, to act in the fashion that Mr Macdonald has suggested. Roger Campbell, followed by David Stewart. Uh, Deputy First Minister, the transfer of Crown Estate assets to Scotland do not clearly reflect what was proposed by the Smith Commission. Will you press the UK Government to provide clarity over the extent of the powers to legislate on the Crown Estate in Scotland out to 200 nautical miles and ensure that this is properly reflected in any legislation going forward. First Minister. Uh, Presiding Officer, uh, the, one of the issues that I raised in my statement was that it's not clear to us at this stage that legislative competence to exercise responsibility out to 200 miles has in fact been devolved in the draft clauses. Uh, that is a, a material and substantive point that uh, we will explore with the United Kingdom Government um, uh, because it was certainly um, I think it was very clear by the nature of the way in which the clauses on the Crown Estate at um, clauses 32 to um, 35 of the Smith Commission report and specifically at clause 34 that the intention of the Smith Commission was to see these responsibilities uh, legislatively devolved at 200 miles. David Stewart, followed by Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, could the Deputy First Minister confirm if it is Scottish Government policy to create a not-for-profit, publicly-owned rail operator at the earliest opportunity in light of the Smith Commission proposals? Deputy First Minister. Well, well the, 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 the was, uh, the, there was and always has been the ability of a not-for-profit uh, operator to uh, bid as part of the, um, for the, the ScotRail franchise, which, of course, was a franchise arrangement put in place by the Labour government and supported by the Labour government. So we are, uh, we encouraged, we invited um, a, a, a 
in non, not for profit interested parties to bring forward a proposition as part of the recent uh, retendering of the ScotRail franchise. And of course, uh, we will use the responsibilities that are devolved to us in this area to ensure that um, such ventures are able to have every possibility in taking forward uh, the running of the railway in Scotland. Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you. I, I thank the Deputy First Minister for the advanced copy of the statement. Not every paragraph of the Smith report managed to achieve crystal clarity, but the proposal to devolve power over onshore oil and gas licensing was absolutely unambiguous. Yet the UK government uh, seems on the point of dishing out licences for fracking, coal bed, methane and other forms of unconventional gas extraction across Scotland, handing over the central belt to the fracking industry. Does the Deputy First Minister agree that such action would render these powers worthless before they are devolved and demonstrate contempt for the process? Uh, and will the Government support this Parliament in taking an early opportunity to vote on this matter, sending a clear signal about what our expectations are from the UK Government? Deputy First Minister. Uh, Presiding Officer, uh, Mr Ewing wrote to the Secretary of State for Energy at the end of last week, um, and th one, the point he made to Ed Davey was that, given the publication of the clauses on Thursday, uh, it was absolutely crystal clear this policy responsibility was now coming to the Scottish Parliament. And our view was that, um, whilst, that is, um, whilst we await that power to be devolved, no decisions about um, licences should be made by the UK Government in that period until such time as the Scottish Parliament is able to exercise those responsibilities. Um, that call was made on, um, uh, on Friday to uh, Davey. We, uh, I'm not aware of a response um, to that call from Mr Ewing. And of course, as Mr Harvey will be aware, Mr Ewing is making a statement on many of these issues to Parliament tomorrow, and I'm sure we'll have more to say in that respect. Thank you. That ends the statement on the Smith Commission report. The next item of business is a further statement, this time by Richard Lockhead, on the Agricultural Holdings Review Group report.